thought I'd do it a little bit differently today, just my notes, my Bible, and a chair that I'll get to in a few minutes. If I don't get to see everyone, I try to shake everybody's hands that I'm able to on Sabbath, but if I somehow miss you today, I want to say to you, Merry Christmas. This is the most wonderful time of the year, in my opinion. However, I realize that there are many at this time of year who struggle. I'm going to talk about that in the message. One announcement I forgot to make note of earlier is that our youth and young adults will be back here in the sanctuary at 4.30 this afternoon to reprise their program that they did a couple of weeks ago. The Christmas story being told, the Christmas drama. And so if you would like to come and witness that again, they'll do that this afternoon right here in the sanctuary at 4.30. And uh, they've had to kind of mix it up a little bit because some are already traveling, but uh, there was so much requests that the kids have all agreed to do it again. So come back and support the kids at 4.30. I want to talk today from the subject of world peace. World peace. If you have your Bibles Open them to the book of Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, I want to read the verse I've already quoted, but it'll stand as the basis for the preaching this morning. Luke chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. Luke chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. You know, just on a sidebar while you're looking it up, if you don't have a Bible, there should be a pew right there, a Bible in the pew right there in front of you. Luke chapter 2, I, was, I, I listened to other preachers, and, and uh, some, of my, some of my favorite preachers or some of the most enjoyable preachers that I enjoy listening to are not necessarily Adventist, and I, I've been noticing in one church in particular, when they read the text, everybody always stands out of reverence for it, and I just think that's kind of cool. I'm not going to ask you to do that. You may not be comfortable with that. But I've been wrestling with this. We might, we might start doing something like that after the first of the year because there's just something about the Word of God that touches the hearts of men and women. Amen? Amen. And I'm impressed that this congregation, they don't even have to be asked. When, the, we're, when they're going to read from the text, they all just kind of stand. It's kind of neat. Luke chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. Suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, Praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. Peace on earth, goodwill toward men. The topic I want to talk about is world peace. Would you join me in one more word of prayer? Father in heaven, as we've now come to the preaching moment, I ask that you would... Send your spirit in mighty abundance and power that the words that are heard would be your words, that your people would be touched and drawn closer to the Savior. I ask that you'd make my preaching so thin in human wisdom that only Jesus might be seen. He who was born as an infant in a manger to save us from our sins. We ask this in his name, the name of Jesus. Amen. Y'all like Charlie Brown? I like Charlie Brown. The old Peanuts comic strip, and there's this one where Lucy comes bounding onto the scene, and she comes up to Charlie Brown, and she says, Merry Christmas, Charlie Brown. I think that since it's this time of the season that we should drop all of our hatred for each other and just love one another. Charlie Brown says, I think that's a great idea. Why don't we do that all year? Lucy said, what are you, nuts? <clears throat> and then I think back a few years, in fact, I think it was 2002, if memory serves me correct, Hollywood produced a movie about Miss America. You know, the Miss America pageant that happens every year, and some people are upset about it. And I, I've just figured out that everybody's going to be upset about something if you give them long enough, all right? We... 
We have the right to choose what makes us happy and mad and upset and offended. And by the way, being offended is a choice that we make, right? We can choose to be offended or we can choose to be about our merry way. Well, they were making fun of the Miss America pageant in that movie with Sandra Bullock called Miss Congeniality. Do you remember that movie? And, and, and they was kind of cliched, but doesn't every Miss America contestant want world peace? And in that movie, if you would have us, if you would believe what we, we saw in the movie, <coughs> we, found, uh, <clears throat> we found out that uh, Sandra Bullock is this undercover FBI agent. She goes in to be a Miss America contestant. And, um, and William Shatner is played by the, is the MC, and, and, all of, and they had coached Sandra Bullock, her character, that when they ask her the question, what's the one thing that you think that the world needs most? Every one of these contestants had gone first and said, world peace, world peace, world peace, world peace, we need world peace. And then we get to Miss Congeniality, Sandra Bullock, and she comes up and she says, uh, well, let's see if I can find it here. What is the one thing the society most important needs? Bullock answers. She says, well, Stan, that would be har- harsher punishment for parole violators. And you can hear this pin drop in, in, uh, around the room, and everybody's just like, what did she just say? And after this long, awkward silence, she goes, and world peace. And everybody's like, oh, whew. you know. It, it's the thing that we talk about most, and... We hear in, in, in our news, and there's, it's just this constant ongoing of, of violence and war and terror. In fact, just this morning, I, I don't uh, listen to the news on Sabbath. In fact, I usually try to stay away from anything having to do with the news. But I wanted to make a post on my Twitter page that church was happening at 11 o'clock today, inviting folks to join us in the stream. And so as I opened up my Twitter to make this tweet, I couldn't help but miss the number one tweet on my page this morning was from Fox News Network that Donald Trump had made a statement. He says that the United States, the United Nations Security Council voted 15 to 0 in favor of an additional sanction on North Korea. The world wants peace, not death. I, I just couldn't help but take notice of it because I knew that this morning I was going to be preaching about world peace And this is what we have. We have people in our world today, in a world full of terror and violence, that are wanting peace. In fact, the Bible tells us that in the days just before Jesus comes the second time, that there will be many saying peace and safety. There are going to be in this world of terror and war that people still want peace and safety. Did you know that going on in the world right now, there are at least 40 conflicts of war, either between tribal groups or nations. The UN, however, does not report on all of them. The UN has decided that you need at least 1,000 deaths to report on the atrocities of war. I don't think that's right, personally. But this is the world that we live in, because we live in a world where terror and violence, and aren't we in a war on terror and violence right here in our own country? And all it takes is one or two or three to make us outraged by it, but the UN thinks it needs to be a thousand. And I start thinking about society, and I think about the world in which we live. The 20th century has been labeled by many the bloodiest century that we ever lived in, World War I happened to end all wars. In fact, they called it the Great War to end war. Remember that, some of you? No, I'm just kidding. Nobody's old enough here to remember that. (coughs) You guys are going to make me work, and I don't have a voice to do it this morning. All right. The Great War was supposed to be the war to end all wars. And not even 30 years later, we fought another Great War to end all wars. Some of you remember that one? Come on, work with me, guys. That was supposed to be funny. I know nobody remembers it. I'm just being funny. Kids are like, I don't get it. And then, right after after World War II, 
There was the Korean War five years later. And right after the Korean War, there was the Vietnam War. And right after the Vietnam War, you fast forward 13, 15 years, and you came to the Persian Gulf War I. And then you fast forward 10 more years after that, and you had 9-11, and then we had Persian Gulf War II. That's what they've started calling the the war in Iraq, and, and then we added to that the war in Afghanistan, and Afghanistan's been a place of war for its entire history. I don't know that we're ever going to see a time on earth where there's total world peace. I mean, it just doesn't feel that way, does it? And yet the text for today tells us that, that there is going to be peace on earth, goodwill toward men. And I look at the text and I think, my goodness, Contrary to the violence and the bloodshed and the hatred of the world, you have, in contrast to that, the words of angels saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, good will toward men. Who has good will toward their, toward their fellow men? All you got to do is go out in that Christmas shopping traffic and see how many times your horn gets honked. Or how many times he gets honked at you while you're trying to merge lanes. Uh, you know, I'll merge with you. Come on over here. I'll merge with you. It's the Christmas spirit, and yet they're running in front of each other. A year ago, I was at Costco. I only had one thing in my hand to buy. I was buying an iPad for the video sound desk back there because all of our technology here is controlled with an iPad, so I went to buy them an iPad. And uh, I was the only thing I had in my hand. It was the box, and that wasn't even the box. They give you the iPad when you're leaving the store. You don't, all you got to do, you, you buy a piece of cardboard that says this will be an iPad. It's kind of crazy. So I'm holding this piece of cardboard, and that's all I'm holding. And there are people in front of me, and this man standing in front of me sees me standing there. I had on my, my red Christmas sweater. And he turned around, he says, hey, do you work here? And I said, no, I, I don't work here. He says, oh, he says, you're just checking out? I said, yeah. He says, well, where's your stuff? I said, oh, this is all I'm buying. He said, look, I got a ton of stuff. Why don't you go in front of me? Oh, thank you. The lady in front of him heard that, and she didn't want to be outdone. She goes, look, I, only, I got a bunch of stuff too. Why don't you go in front of me? Thank you. And before it was all said and done, I was next in line to check out at Costco. And I'm like, wow, you don't ever see this happening. And, you know, and it is so cool. I'm not going to lie. Sometimes it's nice to drive through the through the drive through at Starbucks, and several times this year, I've pulled in to get my drink, and, and somebody's already paid for it. That's so cool. Sometimes, so I got, sometimes people give me gift cards to, to Starbucks, and, and I'll take my gift card, and I put it on my, my phone, and I have this app, and it tells me how much I have, and sometimes I look down, and somebody's blessed me with a gift card. Sometimes when I'm there, I'll, I look up in my mirror, my mirror, and I'll see somebody behind me. I'll be like, hey, put theirs on mine too. It's just fun. They don't even know who I am. They can't say thank you to me, and that's what makes the gift so much fun was because I was able to bless them and they don't even, they, they didn't even have any say in it. They just have to accept the blessing, and that's all it is. And what's really cool is, if when, and, and some of you may remember me telling the story, when the guys were here installing all of our lights a year and a half ago, they asked me to go down and buy them breakfast, so I went down, and I because they were here at 5 o'clock in the morning working, and, and uh, I went and bought them breakfast, and they asked me for some coffee, so I went to buy them some coffee, and while I'm at Starbucks at the drive-thru getting them coffees, buying their orders, um, the lady says, hey, um, it's already been paid for. And I'm like, really? Cool, let me pay for the people behind me. And she started grinning. She goes, you're the 17th in a row that's paid it forward. That is so cool to me. It gives me hope that there is still some good left in humanity. That there are still some people who have a Christ-likeness that makes them think of others even as they're doing something for themselves. Because we're all selfish in the deepest parts of our hearts. But it's just nice to know that there are some people who still think about other people more than themselves. Reminds me of the words of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, who wrote in 1964 uh, a poem. He wrote it on the, uh, uh, as the Civil War was kind of at its height, <coughs> excuse me, this is what he wrote. I heard the bells on Christmas Day, their old familiar carols play. 
And wild and sweet the words repeat of peace on earth, goodwill toward men. That's the promise, but Wadsworth, uh, I'm sorry, Longfellow would turn sorrowful and he wrote the second verse. He said, in despair I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill toward men. Hate and mockery, he writes. You don't find hate and mockery in the hymnals of our church, uh, the songs of the hymnals. Uh, But Longfellow, thinking about the Civil War, about the causes for which it was being fought, no doubt thinking about his own son who had been wounded during the war, wrote the third verse. Then from each loud accursed mouth, the cannon thundered in the south, and with the sound the carols drowned of peace on earth, goodwill to men. It was as if an earthquake rent the earth stones of a continent and made forlorn the households born of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Peace on earth, goodwill to men. That's that's what our text says, Luke chapter 2. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. What are we supposed to do with this text? Well, while we focused on war and killing and terror to this point, it isn't completely true the text. The, the peace that God offers is not limited to peace from war and conflict. In history, man has never really known peace. See, for man, peace is the absence of war. Peace is not refraining from shooting or your neighbor. It's also stop annoying your neighbor. Peace isn't what you get in a warm bath filled with Calgon. Remember those commercials? And here's why. Ever since Adam and Eve took the fruit, you and I and all of humanity with us have been cast into this long and drawn out conflict that isn't just between men and other men and women. It's between God and Satan. And maybe this peace that God offers is not just peace from fellow man, but maybe it's peace from the external powers that be that conflict us every day. Paul writes that our battle is not necessarily with flesh and blood, but with the principalities not of this world. Are you with me? And so in some ways, we've got to understand that God gives greater peace, a peace that in some ways encompasses spiritual warfare. And many of you could give a testimony of how you came to God and finally you felt peace. But if you were honest, you came to God and suddenly you felt more war-torn than you ever had before because you realize that the battle within you is greater because Satan doesn't want to give up his part of the kingdom, does he? And listen, we were made to worship God. We were made to love Him and serve Him with our praises. And when men and women reject their Creator and do their own thing, they also reject peace. And in their path comes turmoil, affecting everything. When Satan, who was then Lucifer, turned his back on God and decided to do his own thing, he brought with him into the universe, not just to the planet, but into the universe, chaos and turmoil. And God had to say, no, we've got to put a stop to this. You serve God, but you have a family member who doesn't, and it causes you anxiety and stress, doesn't it? You see, we're never going to be truly free from the ravages of conflict and stress in our world until Jesus comes. So what does this text mean? Peace on earth, goodwill toward men. Let's put it in context, shall we? Go back a few verses Back to verse 8. Luke chapter 2, verse 8. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And behold, the angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were greatly afraid. The angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, Who is Christ the Lord? Let's just stop right there. As I've thought about it, my ministry, I can't tell you how many times I've had people come into my office and say, Pastor, 
why won't God just speak to me? I wish God would just write a big message in the sky and tell me what's going to happen. Have you ever felt that way? And then all of a sudden, behold, an angel with the full glory of God showed up in the sky to talk to some men and women. Amen. It happens. It happened. A way of instilling fear and awe. This angel filled with the authority of God, the authority of heaven, makes a proclamation, good tidings of great joy for all people. Sometimes I call my wife and I'll say, hey baby, I've got some good news. And she'll say, oh, I could use some good news. You ever done that? You ever called somebody? Got good news. How do they respond? Good news tends to make us happy, doesn't it? Good news is great joy. It's tidings of great joy. (coughs) Excuse me. I bring you good tidings of great joy for all people. This very day in Bethlehem was born a Savior. Now don't miss this. There are three words that happen in this text. And you need to think about this as the shepherds would have thought about it. Three words. First of all, the Bible says that there's good news of great joy. First of all, the Bible tells us that there is a Savior who has been born. What does the word Savior mean? A Savior is somebody who does something for you because of their unique position that you do not possess. If you're in a car that's submerging under the water and you need somebody to break you out, somebody comes and knocks the window out and pulls you from the car, you had a what? You had a Savior. A Savior is somebody who does for you what you could never do for yourself. The dictionary defines a Savior as someone who has the ability to rescue you from imminent danger. The next word that shows up here in the text, let's look at it. Look here at verse 11. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ. Stop and look at that word Christ. The word Christos in Greek means anointed one. There is born for you a Savior, somebody who can do for you what you can't do for yourself. And he is, and it gives us a title, he is Christos. He's the anointed one. And this idea is that he, it's a title for who he is. Okay, you have a Savior, title. You have Christ, title. It's interesting, anointed one. What does anointed one mean? In classical Greek, Christos means to be covered or submerged in oil. I find that very interesting considering that Jesus was submerged in water. The New Testament Christ was submerged in water. And then you have the third word there. Born this day in the city of David, a Savior who is Christ. The third word is the Lord. Don't run past that word Lord there. The angel is not trying to be subtle. The angel is trying to make a statement that something extraordinary has happened in Bethlehem. Now, wait a minute, Pastor. Isn't it already extraordinary that we're talking about angels floating around in the sky talking about this on an evening? Yeah, that's pretty extraordinary, isn't it? But didn't angels appear to people prior to that? Yes? Of course they did. Um, you'll remember that Daniel, when he was in the lion's den, talked about the Lord sent his angel to close the mouths of the lions. So, and angels had had encounters with people prior to this moment. Uh, even Mary had had an angel appear to her. Elizabeth had had an angel appear to her. In fact, if you remember back to the story of the Old Testament, remember the, the, the Assyrians had come and surrounded um, um, the, the Israel's and, and uh, the city of Damascus and Elisha was in there and, and, and they came to him and they said, look, we're going to die. We're all surrounded. And Elijah, Elisha prayed and he said, Lord, open my servant's eyes. And he opened his eyes. And you remember what he saw? He saw chariots all between the city and the Assyrians with a bunch of angels out there. Uh, and if you will, a heavenly military force. That's pretty awesome, isn't it? So this is not a new thing that angels would appear and talk to men. So actually, as extraordinary as it may seem, angels talking to people had been heard of long before this point. Now I think that the way in which they did it is pretty spectacular. They're singing glory to God in the highest. 
the big angelic choir with a multitude of angels. What's a multitude of angels? That's a way of saying a lot of angels showed up and they're all singing in harmony, glory to God in the highest. But then they said, look, you need to go look for a Savior. You need to go look for a Christ. And finally, you need to go look for the Lord. When he said the Lord, it made the shepherds start shaking in their boots or sandals or whatever they were wearing. You think about it, because what is the Lord? The Lord. The Old Testament was full of this concept of the Lord. Think about it. Exodus 20, verse 11. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth. Oh, you see, the Lord is tied to the Creator here. Uh, He was the provider The Lord is going to do something. Uh, uh, Psalms chapter 100 verse 3 says, The Lord, He is God. Psalm 68 verse 19, Blessed be the Lord who daily loads us with benefits. Psalm 144 verse 1, Blessed be the Lord, my rock. Psalm 136 verse 1, Oh, give thanks to the Lord for He is good. Is there any doubt about who the Lord is? The Lord, He is God. Now, if you're the shepherds, you got to be thinking about this. You're thinking, what in the world is going on? The Lord. Look at this. Luke chapter 2, verse 11. The understanding is here. There is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, someone who's going to save you in a way that you can't save yourself. And that Savior is Christ, the one who was anointed for this mission. Uh, You know him as the Lord. Can I put this into layman's terms for you? What the shepherds actually heard, you've got all the language, but what they heard was angels in the sky saying, born to you this night in the city of David was born God. Two amens. Man, those shepherds said amen. Amen. They didn't just say amen. They jumped up and started shouting and said, hey, let's go see this thing. that God as a man on earth? But you see, this had been predicted because the prophet Isaiah had said that a woman would conceive and bear a son and they would call his name Emmanuel. Right there is the promise of the incarnation of God becoming man to do something for us that we can't do ourselves. Suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. If you had just heard that and you had all that background noise, wouldn't you have got up and run to Bethlehem? I'm telling you right now, If you had been privileged to hear the story, you would have been rolling the dice trying to make sure that you got the highest number so you could go and didn't have to stay watching the sheep. (coughs) You'd have been paying somebody (coughs) to watch the sheep so that you could go and see the Savior. Angels were obviously excited about this event. And why not? They've been anticipating this For millennia now. You see, in earthly terms, in humanly speak, it's been 4,000 years since Adam and Eve sinned. Now, if a day is as a thousand years for the Lord, it's only been four days for God. Okay, big deal. But angels had been anticipating this for a while. They're excited because God is finally going to bring to end all of the pain and the suffering of mankind. He is going to come and save them. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Glory to God. What does that mean, glory to God? In the Old Testament, the word hallelujah is the highest form of praise that you can give to God. Hallel, hallelujah, um, it's built, uh, hallelujah is this idea of giving praise to the God who is. Okay, you've heard of the, um, the word Yahweh, the word for God, Yahweh. Yahweh is actually, we say it in English, but if you saw it written out in Hebrew, you wouldn't actually be able to pronounce it. They've written it in such a way that the Hebrews were not allowed to say the word Yahweh. 
It's also Yahweh is the, um, in, they transliterated Yahweh in, into Latin, and it became Jehovah, Yehovah. See, Yahweh, Yehovah, they just kind of transliterated it, and that's where our um, Jehovah, where Jehovah comes from, and that's a 5th century A.D. word, Jehovah. Come, it's built on the word Yahweh. In the Old Testament, whenever the, the, the scribes would come to this word Yahweh, they wouldn't actually say Yahweh, they would say Adonai, Lord. They would call Jesus Lord. And so Yahweh is this word for God in the Hebrew that's built on a verb that means to be. The God who is. God is what? Yes. Does that make sense? It's hard to get your head around the idea that God could be whatever you need him to be, but that's who God is, right? Jesus says, I am. I am what? He is. And what I love about God is he always refers to himself in the present. Remember, he was talking to the Pharisees, and Jesus said, before Abraham was in the past, I am present now. That's who God is. Yahweh is the God who is. Yahweh is part of Hallel. Hallel, Yahweh, hallelujah. Do you see how it kind of goes together? Praise to the God who is. In the Old Testament, hallelujah was the highest form of praise that you could give to God. The last five psalms are the hallelujah psalms. Psalms 146, 47, 48, 49, and 150. All of those psalms are the hallel psalms, the hallelujah psalms. They all begin, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord in Hebrew is hallelujah. Just taught you a Hebrew word there, okay? And so this idea of praise God who is, it's the highest form. It's the height of reverence and adulation that we can give to God. And so we have this word here in, in Luke, translated uh, glory to God in the highest, and it's a way of saying give him praise and honor and worship the highest form that you've got. It's the New Testament equivalent to hallelujah. Praise the God of the heaven who has now become flesh. Praise the God of heaven who has come now to make good on a salvific plan. We've arrived at the key phrase, peace on earth. Peace on earth. Isaiah 9, chapter, chapter 9, verse 6, calls Jesus the Prince of Peace. But have you ever thought about Jesus' life? There was nothing peaceful about Jesus' life either, was there? I mean, you think about it. Mary and Joseph had to leave Nazareth to be taxed in Bethlehem. There's nothing peaceful about taxes. Amen. In Bethlehem, they didn't get the Marriott, they got the manger. They didn't have a doctor, midwife, or doula, they had farm animals. They didn't have time to settle and start a life because Herod decided he was going to kill all the babies in Bethlehem, so they had to flee and go to Egypt. In life, Jesus said, I have no place to lay my head. He was mocked, he was tortured, he was killed. There's nothing peaceful about anything that Jesus experienced in his life. But maybe that was Satan's design. Satan knows why Jesus is born. It's a curse to him. And he's like, hey, look, if I can't get to Jesus, I'm going to get to everybody around Jesus. And I'm going to make it the worst existence anybody ever had. And that's what Satan set out to do against God. But the angel said, peace on earth. Was God lying or have we misunderstood? Make no mistake about it, brothers and sisters. Peace will come. For the believer today, there is some semblance of peace. Jesus told the disciples during his Passover sermon, Peace I live with, leave with you, my peace I give to you. In Romans chapter 5, verse 1, the scriptures say that we have been justified by faith. Now we have peace with God through Jesus Christ our Lord. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 2 says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of your God and Savior, Jesus. In other words, as you grow in your understanding of Jesus, you learn about his grace, and as you learn about God's grace, you will find peace. These verses mean so much more than what we usually see in the Christmas pageants and the nativities that we see around town. What we see in these angelic announcements are the elements of the way in which God words his love for us. Angels declared that God is with us. They told us what he is doing here. They told us that he's saving us. They told us what to expect 
peace. These verses should strengthen our hope in Jesus and build our faith because God is doing what he promised he would do in the beginning. The final words of the angel's song, good will toward men. It's a long disputed phrase. Theologians aren't sure what it should actually be translated as. Peace on earth among his good pleasure, some say. But what it seems to say to me is that God will bring us peace and joy, especially to those who are living within his grace. When you're living in the grace of God, you can expect his peace and goodwill. Such a better picture than the one we began with, isn't it? Scripture says that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. And I thought that I would share with you what really happens in the world when people who believe in Jesus let Jesus become first. I don't think it's an accident that this happened. It's my favorite Christmas story, and I want to share it with you this morning. You've undoubtedly heard of it before. You've undoubtedly heard of the Christmas truce. Truce, The truce of 1914 has been called by Arthur Conan Doyle one of the human episodes amid all the atrocities. It was a beautiful thing. It started in some places on Christmas Eve and on other pla- in other places on Christmas Day, but the truce covered two-thirds of the British and German front during World War I. Perhaps most remarkably, it grew out of a single initiative but sprang up in each place spontaneously and independently. The events... Um, there was a letter that was included in Australia School magazine that depicts the, tru- the Christmas truce. Whether the letter is 100% accurate, we don't know that. What we do know is that the truce was. And I'd like to share the letter that appeared in, on Christmas Day. Um, it appeared in the school magazine depicting the events of Christmas Day, 1914. Dear Janet, my sister... It's two o'clock in the morning, and most of our men are asleep in their dugouts. Yet I myself could not sleep before writing to you the wonderful events of this Christmas Eve. In truth, what happened seems almost like a fairy tale. If I hadn't been through it myself, I would scarcely believe it. Just imagine when you and the family sang Christmas carols before the fire there in London, I did the same with enemy soldiers out here on the battlefield in France. As I wrote before, there has been little serious fighting of late. The battles of the war left so many dead that both sides have held back until replacements could come from home. We have mostly stayed in our trenches and waited. What a terrible waiting it has been, knowing that any moment an artillery shell might land and explode beside us in the trench, killing or maiming several men. And in daylight, not daring to lift our heads above ground for fear of a sniper's bullet. And the rain, it falls almost every day. Of course, it collects right in our trenches where we must bail it out with pots and pans. And with the rain has come mud and a good foot or more of it deep. It splatters and cakes everything. It constantly sucks out our boots. One new recruit got his feet stuck in it and then his hands too when he tried to get out. Just like in that American story of the tar baby. Through all of this, we couldn't help but feeling curious about the German soldiers across the way. After all, they face the same dangers we do, and they slog about in the same muck. What's more, their first trench is only a mere 50 yards from us. Between us lays no man's land, bordered on both sides by barbed wire. Yet they are close enough that sometimes we can hear their voices. Of course, we hated them when they killed our friends. But other times we joked about them and almost felt like we had something in common. And now it seems they felt the same. Just yesterday morning, Christmas Eve day, we had our first good freeze. Cold as we were, we welcomed it because at least it froze the mud. Everything was tinged white with frost while a bright sun shone overhead. Perfect Christmas weather. During the day, there was, a little, sh- there was little shelling or rifle fire from either side. And as darkness fell on our Christmas Eve, the shooting stopped entirely. Our first complete silence in months. We hoped it might promise a peaceful holiday, but we didn't count on it. We'd been told the Germans might attack and try to catch us off guard. 
I went to the dugout to rest, and laying on my cot, I must have drifted asleep. All at once, my friend John was shaking me awake to awake. Come and see, see what the Germans are doing. I grabbed my rifle and I stumbled out of the trench. I stuck my head cautiously above the sandbags. I never hoped to see a stranger and more lovely sight. Clusters of tiny lights were shining all around the German line, left and right as far as the eye could see. What is it? I asked in bewilderment, and John answered, Christmas trees. And so it was. The Germans had placed Christmas trees in front of their trenches, lit by candles like little beacons of goodwill. And then we heard their voices raised in the song, Still knocked, he knocked. The carol may not be familiar to us in Britain, but John knew it and translated it. Silent night, holy night. I've never heard a lovelier or more meaningful tune in that quiet, clear night, first dark, softened by a dark quarter moon. When the song finished, the men in our trenches applauded. Yes, British soldiers applauding the Germans. Then one of our own men started singing and we all joined in. The first Noel, the angels did say. In truth, we sounded not nearly as good as the Germans with their fine harmonies, but they responded with enthusiastic applause of their own, and then began another, O oh, Tannenbaum, O oh, Tannenbaum, and then we replied, O oh, come, all ye faithful. But by this time they joined in, singing the same words in Latin, Adeste Fidelis. Britain and German soldiers harmonizing across no man's land. I would have thought nothing could be more amazing than what was to come next. English, come over, we heard them shout. You no shoot, we no shoot. There in the trenches, we looked at each other in bewilderment. Then one of us shouted jokingly, you come over here. To our astonishment, we saw two figures rise from the trench, climb over their barbed wire, and advance unprotected across no man's land. One of them called, Send officer to talk. I saw one of our men lift his rifle to the ready, and no doubt others did the same, but our, ca our captain called out, Hold your fire. He climbed out and went to meet the Germans halfway. We heard them talking, and a few minutes later, the captain came back with a German cigar in his mouth. We've agreed there'll be no more shooting before midnight tomorrow, he announced, but sentries are to remain on duty, and the rest of you are to stay alert. Across the way, we could make out groups of two or three men starting out of trenches and coming toward us. Then some of us were climbing out too, and in minutes more, there we were in no man's land, over a hundred soldiers and officers from each side shaking hands with men who had just a few moments before been trying to kill us. Before long, a bonfire was built, and around it we mingled, British khaki and German gray, I must say the Germans were a little better dressed with fresher uniforms for the holiday. Only a couple of our men knew German, but more of the Germans knew English. And I asked him why it was. Oh, most of us have worked in England, he said. Before all this, I was a waiter at the Hotel Cecil. Perhaps I waited on your table. Perhaps you did, I said, laughing. He told me he had a girlfriend in London and that the war had interrupted their plans for marriage. I told him, don't worry, we'll have you beat by Easter. You can come back and marry her then. <laughs> he laughed, and then he said he'd send me a postcard if I would give him my address. He promised me to invite me to his wedding. Another German had been a porter at the Victoria Station. He showed me the picture of his family back in Munich. His eldest sister was so lovely, I said I should like to meet her someday. He beamed and said he very much would like to give me his family's address. Even those who could not converse could still exchange gifts. We gave them cigarettes for their cigars, our tea for their coffee, our corned beef for their sausage. They obviously weren't Adventists. <laughs> Badges, buttons from uniforms were changed. And one of our lads walked off with an infamous spiked helmet. I myself traded a jackknife for a leather equipment built, belt, a fine souvenir to show when I got home. Newspapers, too, changed hands, and the Germans howled with laughter at ours. They assured us that France was finished and Russia was nearly beaten, too. We told them that that was nonsense. And one of them said, well, you believe your newspaper and we'll believe ours. 
That was the precursor to fake news. <laughs> Clearly, they are lied to, yet after meeting these men, I wonder how truthful our own newspapers are being. These are not the savage barbarians we've read so much about. They are men with homes and families, hopes and fears, principles, and yes, love of country. In other words, they were men much like ourselves. Why had we been taught to believe otherwise? As it grew late, a few more songs were traded around a fire, and then all joined in, and I'm not lying to you, we sang Auld Lang Syne. We parted with the promise to meet again tomorrow, and even talk of a football match began. I was just getting started back to the trenches when an older German clutched my arm. My God, he said, why can't we all just have this peace and go home? I told him gently, then you must ask your emperor. He looked at me searchingly and said, perhaps, my friend, but we must also ask our hearts. And so, dear sister, tell me, has there ever been such a Christmas Eve in all of history? And what does it mean? This impossible befriending of enemies. For the fighting here, of course, it means regrettably little. Decent fellows those soldiers may be, but they follow these same orders we do. Besides, we are here to stop their army and send it home, and we could never shirk that duty. Still, one cannot help but imagine what would happen if in the spirit shown here, if it were to catch the nations of the world. Of course, disputes must always arise, but what if our leaders were to offer well wishes in place of warnings? Songs in place of slurs, presents in place of reprisals. Would not it end all war at once? All nations say they want peace, yet on Christmas morning I wonder if we want it quite enough. Your loving brother, Tom. It's powerful to think that Jesus It's crazy to think that for 24 hours because of the story of Jesus they would lay down their weapons. Sharing the story of Jesus. If the story of Jesus could do that then, what could it do in your heart now? In this room, there's maybe 160, 170 people. Are you at peace with everyone else in the room? Is there someone here that just kind of bugs you and irks you? They don't have to get under your skin, you know. You can make a different choice. One of my favorite quotes says something like this. If there's somebody that annoys you, pray for them. It might change them. But more importantly, it might change you. Often I find the problems I have in life are my problems, not yours. The question is, is am I willing to own it and make them mine? Tonight, tomorrow, Monday, as you share the gifts and fellowship of family time, remember the real reason for the season. Jesus truly does unite hearts and lower weapons. Please don't let your gift giving get in the way without taking time to thanking God for the gift that he gave. Give glory to God in the highest, the way the angels did. Sing his praises and worship the king. Glory to God most high, because God gives peace on earth and goodwill toward men. Know the peace that passes understanding in your life and in your heart, for this is the true story and the true meaning of Christmas. I want that peace, how about you? I want that goodwill toward men, how about you? You and yours, 
a most merry and beautiful Christmas. May the peace of God be felt in your homes and your hearts this Christmas season. Father God, as we conclude this time of study together, may the joy of Jesus be felt in our hearts. May the joy of Christmas unite us, not just for a 24-hour period of time, but may, may we begin to be united more and more until the day when Jesus comes and reunites us totally and completely for all of eternity. We celebrate your first advent today, Jesus, but we look forward to and long for your second advent all the more. Wouldn't it be cool if this Christmas we also celebrated the blessed hope for which we cling and yearn? Father, if not today, when? We wait to see our Savior whom we have waited. So give us the peace for which we yearn. We ask this blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. I pray you've been blessed by our worship this morning. I invite you to join me across the way for our fellowship luncheon. And may the peace of God be yours. Good tidings, peace on earth, and goodwill toward men. Happy Sabbath. I'd like to take just an added moment and say thank you for joining us here on the online campus of the South Tacoma Adventist Fellowship. We at staff are thrilled to hear from viewers just like you from all over the world. And we're thrilled to have you join this growing ministry. If you have questions or comments or would like more information about today's topic, I invite you to take just an extra moment to go to our website. It's www.staffonline.org. There you'll find today's presentation as well as previously recorded presentations. You'll also find a contact form that you can use to get in contact with us here at staff and there's a prayer request page that you can go to if you would like our ministry team to join with you in petitioning the Heavenly Father. That's www.staffonline.org. While you're there, we'd invite you to take a moment to consider partnering with us in this ministry. This ministry is made possible through the generosity of the members of the staff church as well as online viewers like yourself. We believe that Jesus is coming soon and we want to share this gospel with as many people in every way possible that we can before he comes. If you've been blessed today, would you consider being a ministry partner with us and sharing the gospel? You can do that simply by looking for the green link that says give at our website. Finally, I want to say once again, thank you so much for being a part of our time together today. And as we leave you, let me leave you with the words of Paul that he shared to the Thessalonian church. He says this, May our Lord Jesus Christ and God our Father who loved us and in his special favor gave us everlasting comfort and good hope. Comfort your hearts and give you strength in every good thing that you do and that you say. May the Lord's blessings be with you. We'll see you next time.